2012. I'm interviewing Norman Carlton at 82 Carpenter Avenue, Bristol, Connecticut, 06010-4412. Uh, the interviewer is Robert Weisel, working with Central Connecticut State University. Uh, Norman, would you please state your full name, date of birth, and current address? The name is Norman Henry Carlton. 82 Carpenter Avenue, Bristol, Connecticut. And what was the other thing? Uh, date of birth. Date of birth, February 17, 1920. Okay. And you served in which war? World War II in the European Theater of Operations. Okay. And what branch of service were you in? Armored Field Artillery Battalion, 10th Armored Division. And what was your highest rank? Ten te technician, 5th grade. And uh, in what general locations did you serve? France, Germany, Luxembourg, and Czechoslovakia. Okay. You uh, drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted in 1942. And then, that was 1942. I had been going out with this girl named Laura for a few years and we decided to get married. So then Laura mentioned the war in Europe, along with the Pacific conflict. We perhaps should wait and wed after peace has been returned. In the meantime, I received an order from the Army to report in Hartford for physical. The Army told me I would never be drafted because of poor vision of 2200. So we decided we got married. So on June 6, 1942, we did just that. And then about two months later, I was called again for another physical by the Army. So I went to Hartford and had it done. All this time, they said, was one, two, you're in. <laughs> I guess they were desperate. <laughs> and they said I was 1A. <laughs> A few months later, I was leaving Bristol by train going to Fort Devens for my Army tour of duty. We were in Fort Devens for a few days, got all new clothes, and we went to lectures and were told that we were leaving on a morning train for an undisclosed location. We boarded the train and told, were told to pull down all the shades, never open them until we were told to do so. Finally, after three days, we were told to open the shades. I noticed a factory in the distance out the window and the sign said, Tom's Peanuts, Columbus, Georgia. I recognized that right away, so I knew we were at Fort Benning. After the train pulled off to the siding, we disembarked, and they gave each, boy, each person a card with a printing on it, like, for instance, 423FA. To me, it meant nothing. But I knew after a while that it meant 423rd Armored Field Artillery Battalion. They then called off the numbers and were loaded into some GMC trucks for our ride to our destination. The 423rd was assigned to the Sand Hill area of Fort Benning. The battalion consisted of headquarters batteries, service battery, A, B, and C batteries, plus the 80th Medical Battalion. I was assigned to the motor pool, where all the vehicles were taken when they needed some mechanical problems, had mechanical problems. I was with the motor pool and I did not like it, living in Greece. <laughs> so one day as I put a notice on a bullet, they, I noticed that they put a notice on a bulletin board saying that a typist was needed in the personnel office. Seeing I could type, I rushed and was transferred from the motor pool to the personnel the same day. <laughs> My job was to take care of insurance and personnel papers for new men coming in every day. In a short while, I was promoted to technician fifth grade, and I liked the job very much. One big move was after about six months in Benning, we were ordered to go to Murfreesboro, Tennessee for field maneuvers. We lived and slept outside in the Tennessee woods for three months. The 10th Armored was then ordered to Camp Gordon, Georgia, near Augusta. The division got more training, and after about four months, the division was en route to Camp Shanks, New York, 
which was about 20 miles north of New York City on the Hudson River. This was a transient camp and was taken care of by Italian prisoners of war. We were at Shanks for a few days and then boarded another train for our trip to the port of embarkation, Pier 41, Hudson River. We boarded the ship, which was a Brazilian ship called the E.B. Alexander. We settled in our designated spot around 4 a.m. We felt the ship slowly back out of the slip, and we were on our way, so we thought. About a half an hour later, the ship came to an abrupt halt. We were allowed to go out on deck, and we could see the cars on Long Island Expressway. We were told to pack up all our belongings and get ready to get transferred to ferry boats and return to Pier 41. We could see the fleet of boats coming downstream to pick us up as we went down the rope ladders onto the ferries. At Pier 41, there was another ship on the other side of the pier. It was called the SS Brazil with an entire Brazilian crew. We unpacked our gear for the long trek ahead. In the meantime, the convoy of hundreds of ships continued on their way. We finally caught up with the convoy after three days on our own, which was scary. During the daylight hours, we were allowed to go out on deck and enjoy the sun. Uh, after about 20 days at sea, we arrived at the coast of England, where we anchored. We were to land in Cherbourg, France, but the Germans had scuttled all ships and harbor could not be entered. We could see a convoy of DUKW amphibian personnel carriers coming our way, and that was supposed to be our transportation from ship to shore. We also we all could also see a four by oh, see from four by four personnel carriers waiting on shore to take us to our destination. I probably said that. Being of French heritage, I speak, read, and write French. I wanted to see France. So I took a spot right in back of the driver's cab, and I got a great view of all the surroundings. But as fate had it, it started to rain very heavy, heavily, and I was drenched. And when we reached our destination, a huge field just outside the village called Le Fille, France. We stayed at that location for one month, getting all new tanks, trucks, jeeps, and so forth. And then we were committed to action at a little village called Mars Latour. The Germans were waiting for us as the next target would be the city of Metz, France. This was a there was a large fortress near Metz where the Germans were well entrenched and they had fortified it very well. The army's leaders decided to avoid direct combat with the Germans, so they decided to surround the fort and therefore forcing the Germans to surrender. As our trek continued, we advanced toward German territory and the Germans were full retreat. We took the city of Trier on a French-German border and rested for a few days. We all, I also have some souvenirs from Trier, which I didn't show you. It was complete silverware from a hotel called the Porta Negra. We were in Sacto, they knocked the hotel was all blasted apart. So I took some silverware and I still have it here. I just want to get that in there. <laughs> okay, we, we then continued our trek, entered Germany and very quickly advanced. Then we turned down south, going down to Alpine country, where there was no conflicts. It was great, and we settled in after the war as army of occupation in a beautiful castle near Weilheim, Germany. When the war was over in Europe, a point system was determined, and some of us with low points remained in Europe as an army of occupation. Most of us with the 10th Armored Division were transferred to other divisions who did not have enough points to go home. I was transferred to the 80th Infantry Division and remained there until my discharge from the Army at Fort Devon's Mass on November 9, 1946, exactly where it all started. Well.
Uh, let's go along with more adventures of my European adventures okay. with the 10th Armored Division. I thought of something that was quite unusual. We landed in France about a month prior to this. Even we were living in a small village called Lathiel, in tents. I got a letter from my mother one day saying that my stepbrother, who I had not seen, was also stationed in France. I had seen him in years. My brother was in the U.S. Navy. He was an officer, landed on D-Day, and established a radio communication network between the mainland and the ships at sea that were far out at anchor to avoid firing their big guns. I asked my battery commander if I could have a day off to go to Cherbourg to see my brother. He said, sure, catch the ration truck tomorrow morning that goes to Cherbourg. And that was it. I was walking down the street down the beach area and a GI walked up to me and could not help staring at him. He looked so familiar. I took a chance and I yelled, Mike Boyko. He turned around fast and found that it was my neighbor that lived with me on Kelly Street in Bristol. We talked for a few minutes, and uh, we talked for a few minutes, and he left to go on his way. Imagine meeting a neighbor on the street in France. No, now I know what to do next. At the next moment, two naval officers walked up towards me, and I saluted them, and I had a question for them. I told them I was looking for a Navy officer and I believed to be in this area. They asked me what his name was and I told them. They said, oh yeah, he's a good friend of ours. How about that? They told me he was a communications officer and was stationed on a cliff aboard the landings near D-Day, on D-Day. I asked for directions and they told me exactly how to get there. When I got to Omaha Beach, I saw this tall cliff. There was a military policeman directing traffic. I told him I was looking for Lieutenant Lucier and he was in charge of Navy communications. He pointed up to the top of the hill and he says, and, and I could see the radio station. And that was it. I walked up the top of the cliff and there was a lot of Quonset huts. I asked another sailor if he knew Lieutenant Lucier and he pointed to a Quonset hut and he said, that's usually his, where he stays. I went up and walked into the hut, nobody around. One door was partially open. I could hear someone on the phone or radio. I knocked on the door and was said, come on in. I had gone to the right place and it was my brother, Oliver, in the flesh. He was smoking a cigar and said to me, where the hell did you come from? I told him my outfit was in camp about 20 miles inland. He then asked me if I had any lunch and I said, no. He told me to follow him to the mess tent, and I told the chef, to, and he told the chef to make up a meal. I was overwhelmed when the chef asked me, "How do you like your steak?" I said, "I'll take it raw." <laughs> he made me a beautiful meal of steak, mashed potatoes, corn, rice, soft bread, and coffee. It was delicious compared to eating C and K rations. He then asked me how. I was to get transportation to go back to my outfit. I told him I was going to hitchhike. So he got on the phone and he called a motor pool to set up a Jeep and driver. After a while, I was on my way back to Lathiel. The Jeep driver had a map, luckily, for by the time we got to Lathiel, it was dark. I felt so sorry for this lad driving back to Omaha Beach in the dark. But as far as I'm concerned, maybe he's still out there looking for me. I did not see my brother for six years after that. He stayed in the Navy for 27 years and all and retired. He got out on 1939, but on Pearl Harbor Day, he was recalled to active duty to go to the South Pacific. And he retired from the Navy after that. This is a true story. It may bring back a lot of memories, and he passed away in 1994 and is interred in Arlington National Cemetery in Washington. That's my story. Sure. Let me, uh, uh, now you can question me all you want. Okay. <laughs> let, let me get some dates. Uh, you, you were drafted? 1942. 1942. 
And you went to Devon's, then you went to Fort Benning. Fort Benning. And then to... Tennessee Maneuvers. And Camp Gordon. Right. And then Port of Embarkation and Europe. Okay, when did you leave for Europe? When did we leave for Europe? Yeah. Boy, that's... Uh, God, I don't know. That was in 1940, late, early 43. And you went into... Uh, you went into England initially? No, we didn't get off the ship at all. Oh. We just anchored off the coast of England. And then we were taken in by ducks, D-U-K-W. We were taken into the uh, shore, and then on shore they, they took us by truck to where we were supposed to stay. But that was, that was in France. That's in France. So that was after D-Day. Oh, yes, yes. They were inland about 50 miles, Okay. the troops. We could, we could hear firing. So, my guess is you went to Europe in 1944 after D-Day. Yes, correct? shortly okay. after. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And um, what were your what were your duties? Were you still in personnel at that time? Or? No personnel. They transferred me to tanks. Mm -hmm. So I was a driver and radio operator in tank. See, everybody has two jobs in the tank. Okay. You have to learn somebody else's work in case he gets injured. So I was a driver, and then I was a radio man. We had to be on a radio 24 hours a day. Oh, I got to tell you a very cute story, and I got a picture of that for you. We were in this little town, I can't think of the name of it, in Germany, and we, they told us, pull your vehicles in between the houses, the tank in between the houses, get set up to stay here for a couple of days. So we did, we were row houses. All the little tiny houses built in a row, with a little yard in between. So we did just that. We set up our radio communication cables inside the house. We had to be on the radio 24 hours, so everybody had a four-hour tour. At night, I was on night duty on the radio. I used to listen to night, all night long. That's when I did this. Oh, yeah. I used to have a little diary, and I said, Jesus, I, I got to put down what happened with today, see? And I could remember everything that happened, you know? <clears throat> Anyway, during the night, we would, the, I think I was off duty. I was in the house, that's right. I was off duty. And you could hear a Germans firing 88s over our head. <laughs> They'd go over here and <laughs> One of them hit the house. But nothing happened. We, boom, the whole house shook. Nothing happened, though. I said, I wonder what happened. Well, I'll, I'll see it tomorrow morning. I got up the next day and went outside, looked around the house. Oh my God, there was an 88 shell sticking out of the house. It was a dud. It exploded, but on the outside, you know. And I got a, there's a picture of it in one of his magazines here, of the house uh, with, the, with, the, with the shell. If you don't think that was scary, oh my God. If that thing would have went off, that would have killed us all. Probably still be buried there. A lot of little things like that happened, you know, on the side, you know, oh my, like having that boy there work for me. Tell, tell me that story. Yeah. Well, this was after the war. We were down in southern Germany in the Adolf Hitler Schule. And like I told you before, I wanted somebody to keep my room clean, you know. So I went to town one night and this little boy was on the corner, raggy, dressed up very raggy, you know. So I started talking. You talk English? He said, a little bit so, a little bit so. I says, uh, I've got a, I've, I've got a place for you to live if you want to work for me. He says, what do you mean? I told him what I want him to do. Said, okay. Okay. Said, no parents, no, know where he come from. So anyway, he, he did that. I got him a uniform, a GI uniform, but no, no decorations on it. <laughs> and, uh, and he used to stay in my room and he'd press all our clothes, wash our clothes, and cl oh, shine our shoes. The place was immaculate I was, until that one day he made a mistake. He wanted to go to town. I said, well, I said, go to town, but don't get too too friendly, you know? I mean, you want to get caught. But he, and he said, no, I don't know. I said, you better not go. I said, on second thought. But he went anyway. He stole a GI truck, and he went to town. He got caught, naturally. And I never saw him after that. But little John, he was, he was a, such a good worker. He kept that house so clean and everything. Do you remember his name? John. His first name was John, and he had a Polish name, but I couldn't ever think of it. 
It's about that long. <laughs> but anyway, he uh, I never saw him no more after that. Yeah, that's one I am. Yeah. Did you see much combat when you were going through France? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. What? I lost two tanks. Tracks. Tell me the story. Well, we were going into this one town. We are going down a hill. Captain Samuel Z. Cohen was the uh, commander of the tank. Very, very nice little Jewish boy. And he was very nice. He was very strict, though. He was a GI all the way through. He was a foot doctor. In civilian life, they made him an artillery officer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, anyway, we're going down this side of the road to cross the Rhine River. They had pontoon boats all the way across the river. So we were going down the side of the hill. The Germans were firing at us from the other side. So I said, and he says, uh, we're going down. He says, hey, Carlton. I said, yes, sir. He said, are you scared? I said, yes, I am, sir. He said, me too. <laughs> that, that didn't have much confidence. So anyway, we went down there, and we got on there, and we had to go across the river. So we had one man go in the front and walk in front of the tank with a little tiny flashlight because all you had was two tracks. And if you went off that track, you went into the brook. <coughs> so we went across that stream very slowly, but we finally made it when I was thankful. We got on the other side, and there was some big 140-millimeter anti-aircraft guns firing. GI, I mean, our side, right by the edge of the river. So we said, they told us to pull our tank off the road, get yourself a place to stay, and stay there till morning when the sun comes out and we can see where you are. So we did, and I said, well, geez, I'm going to sleep underneath the tank. So I got up my, my bedroll, and I rolled it up underneath the tank, you know. And it, I didn't realize that, but those 140s, about 2 o'clock in the morning, they started firing. Oh, my God, I never was so scared in my life. The boom, boom, you, you could feel the ground move, you know. So we stayed there, and the, all the buildings were burning. It was a big fire. And we got across the river. We went into this little town, and it was all destroyed. And we kept going, and we kept chasing the Germans. And they kept going, and yes, one time. Then, then Oh, yes, and then the, just a little while down the road, we they told us to pull off because the Germans had a, were firing, and they didn't, we didn't want to take no chances. So pull off the road and get some kind of cover, if you can. So we pulled off the, as we were pulling off the road, I ran over a German mine. And they blew the tank track right off. So we were staying. They were lucky, though, because we were surrounded by our own tanks, you know. So they came and they took us and they put us in trucks and took us back a little ways. And they assigned us a different uh, outfit temporarily. And then as we went on, we got reassigned to another. They got more tanks. The, I uh, can't think of the name of the outfit, but it was an outfit that took care of all our vehicles. In combat, they had all kind of retrieving vehicles and everything. So they had a, a spot back. They repaired the tanks and then they reassigned them. And that way got, we got a new uh, new tank, an M4. Yeah. It, was that the tank that you drove mostly, the M4? Yeah, the M4A3. I got a picture of it. I'll show you down the cellar. The big wall poster. Showed all the inside the tank and shows you where everything is. It's very interesting. Yeah. Um, did you, were you, where were you when the war ended? Well, I was, I was in Czechoslovakia, a little town called Cheb, C-H-E-B, Czechoslovakia. And we stayed there. We were living in a big, nice big house. We took over the house and we had our, we set up our, our, our equipment there, you know, and so forth. We stayed there. Then they told us we're leaving for, Frankfurt, Germany? I think it was Frankfurt, yeah. We're leaving for Frankfurt and they're going to catch the train to go to part of embarkation. So we did. They put us on a train all the way across France to a port of embarkation. I can't think of the name of the town now, but anyway, we were there for about two or three days. But you, they set you up in pure, oh yeah, I got a cute story. They set us up in pyramidal tents. You know what a pyramidal tent is? It's a tent that holds nine people. So I said, well, it was winter. It was starting to get cold, you know. So I said, boy, i got to get me a place next to a stove. <laughs> the stove was right in the middle. And I got a step on my bunk right here like this, and the stove was right here. 
And I told the guys, I said, I don't care if you play cards all night if you want to. But I said, just keep that stove going. So I took my uh, all my clothes, I threw my overcoat over on my feet. Well, these guys put a lot of wood in the stove to go play cards. They didn't pay much attention. My, my overcoat caught on fire. And the back panel, it burned a beautiful square panel right in the back. Well, anyway, when we got ready to leave, I said, I went to the supply sergeant. I said, I want a new overcoat. What do you mean? I said, what do you mean, what do you mean? I said, I need a new overcoat. He said, I, well, you got to see what the old one looks like. So I, came up, I said, how's this for proof? I showed him the, the piece of, he said, I think you deserve an overcoat. <laughs> but he wouldn't give me one. I had to wait till I got back to the United States to get a new overcoat. I still have it. Why wouldn't he give me one? Huh? Why wouldn't he give you one? I don't know. Maybe a short, you know, a shortage, you know, can't be, you know. There's more necessity than that. <laughs> but anyway, I'll never forget that. And when I looked, felt so silly when we got on the ship to come home and I had my overcoat on just the front and it looked like a fake overcoat. <laughs> You yeah. mentioned you, you speak and write French. Did the Army make any use of that while you were in no, France? No, no, no. No, they, they, I, I thought they might, but they, they didn't. I used to rewrite and speak. Well, I got along great with the French people, naturally. Oh, yes, I got to tell you about Luxembourg. I still write to those people in Luxembourg, relatives, naturally. When I was there, well, let's say we pulled into this town, big, big school called the... Ecole Brille, B-R-I-L-L-E school. Three-story building. They told us, go in there, find a place to stay. You're going to be here for a while. Okay. So I, me and this fellow from Pennsylvania, Bob Morris. I says, come on, Bob. Look out the window over the city. Look over the city. I said, where would you like to sleep tonight? He said, I like that house over there. I said, I like that one over there. Well, I says, come on, we'll go see. So we went out. Went to the first house, and I had rang the doorbell, and the woman came to the door, so I asked her if she had a place for a couple of soldiers to put up. And she says, I did, but she says, I got the promise of somebody. I said, okay, thank you. So let's go to the other house. So we went to the other house. The little woman was out in the front sh uh, sweeping the sidewalk with a broom. broom. And I started in, Spanish, in French, you know. I said, bonjour, madame. And then she says, vous êtes américain. You are American. I says, oui. Vous parlez français? I said, oui. So anyway, I had it made. The front door was open. You know. So I asked her if she had a place. She says, well, I'll tell you what. She says, I promised it to a captain. And if he said, he said, if he's not back here by 7 o'clock, let it go to somebody else. So at quarter to 7, I was waiting at the front door. And then the, the, the man never showed up. So we moved in. She gave us a nice room right in the front of the house. There's pictures of the house in there. And uh, me and Bob Moore slept in that room. And, oh, the, those people were just like my mother and father. They were the greatest people on the face of the earth. They had two sons, George and Willie. Willie was in the Luxembourg Army, which was almost nothing. And Willie, and George and Willie, yeah. Well, anyway, George had a son later on in life, and he named him after me. And I still write to him. Normand Grine, N-O-R-M-A-N-D-G-R-E-I-N, Dudelange, Luxembourg, D-U-D-E-L-A-N-G-E, -E. No, number 13, Rue Pierre-Curier Street, uh, Pierre Carrier Street, Th number 13, I still remember it. Those people, well, anyway, we used to, we there, got there and then, we got to be so friendly, so, oh, they're just, like I say, just like my mother and father. So they were starving, those people. The, the Germans took all the cows, all the animals for food. So I brought them food from the kitchen. I go to the mess sergeant, I say, what do you got? I can, I'm living with some people here, and I says, Jesus, I says, what do you got I can have? He says, well, see what you want there, take it. So I took a, I, used to, I introduced them to peanut butter. They never had peanut butter. Oh, so I brought them a three, I think three pound can from the kitchen. And I brought them white bread, GI bread. What is that? She says, she says I said, oh, that's loaf of bread. So she sliced it. She says, that's not bread, that's cake. 
because they used to use br the dark bread. All their bread was dark. So I brought them bread every so often. I, I brought them that peanut butter, and I brought them coffee. Oh, the coffee. They went crazy over the instant coffee, the powdered coffee. They loved it, you know. So and then, uh, oh, yes, another thing I did. I introduced them how to play setback cards. And, and then after a while, she said, she'd make supper for us, with, you know, with the food we brought there. And she says, hurry up and wash the dishes so we can play cards. <laughs> And they even invited neighbors to come over. Just like an oddity, you know. So we had it made there. It was very nice. It was a nice, beautiful stucco house with steel shutters. Every night we used to close the shutters. But they were prepared for war. There's no getting away from it. So anyway, we stayed there for a while. Then we took off and went back into our regular duties. And I used to, every time I had a chance, I used to sneak back to Doodle on to go see them. I asked the commanding officer if I got the day off to go to do and see these people. But yeah, go ahead. So I used to go see them. They were, and I, in fact, I just got a card the other day from the boy, Norman. He was on vacation in Switzerland, sent me a postcard. Oh, no, I can't go with him. Did, um, did, did you say you were at Bastogne, at the Battle of the Bulge? Just the outside of Bastogne, yeah. We were in Dudelange, which was only a few, oh, maybe 30 miles from Bastogne. But they, every night we used to have a plane come over and fire, uh, strafe the place, every night. Because we had a gas dump there in the Lounge. The United States Army had a big gas dump. GI cans piled up to the roof. And he used to come over every night and strafe. And we had 50 caliber machine guns mounted on street corners. And our orders were, as soon as a siren blew, we were supposed to go and man those guns. Well, one night we went out, the siren blew, and I ran outside there, and they closed all the shutters on the house. We went to the corner, put our helmets on, and that guy came over, and we got him. We fired on him, and I could see the smoke coming out, and he, it was late, about, about 7, 30, 8 o'clock, and he was just starting to get dark, but we could see the smoke coming out of the airplane, and he, we never saw it no more after that. But, but that was a lucky hit. Bed check Charlie, we used to call him. <laughs> Every night, excuse me. I thought there had to be a nickname for him. Yeah, Bed Check Charlie. Yeah. Yeah. So after the war, you came home, you said, in November of 46? I got discharged in January 9 of 46. January 46. What did you do then? Well, first, we, when we came home, we took the boat in uh, France. We landed in New York. They took us to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And then they took us to Fort Devons. And I got my I stayed in Devons for about two, three days, I guess. In the meantime, <coughs> I got, I said, geez, if I can get some time off, I'd like to go home and get my car. So on discharge day, I could scram like heck, you know. So I went to the commanding officer and I asked him if I could have a pass to go to Worcester, which was Worcester, Massachusetts, was not too bad. He said, yeah, go ahead and I'll give you a pass. So I took a pass and I went to Worcester. I took a bus in Worcester to Hartford. And I called my wife up and she came and picked me up. And then I took her home. And then I went back to Worcester with my car. This one here, 39 Chevy. And uh, then on discharge day, they gave me a discharge, and like I say, January 9. And about five or six guys said, where do you live? I said, Bristol. You want to, how about giving us a ride to Hartford? We'll pay you gas, you know, money. So I had the full house of cars, dropped the guys off along the road all the way up to Bristol. And the funny thing is, oh yeah, one time, oh yeah, when I went to meet her at the garage, at the, uh, she, pick, she went to the uh, railroad station in Hartford to pick me up. They brought the car, and her and her uncle had his car too. So they, uh, I, when I was getting out of the car, I mean getting out of the train, and I was walking down towards the station, she was walking up with her kid sister, the one that was up here. I didn't even recognize him. I walked right by him. She turned around and said, no! <laughs> I said, oh! <laughs> I, have that. I didn't even recognize her. Oh, she always reminds me of that. Oh, how long had it been since you'd seen her? Well, it was quite a while. I was overseas for almost two years. So it was quite a while, you know. But when I was here in the States, I used to see her almost every month. We used to meet in New York. Mm -hmm. I'd get a three-day pass. 
which was Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I used to try to get a pass. So I'd take off Friday afternoon right after work, take the train to New York, get in New York Saturday morning, Saturday, and the law used to be, be there. So we had Saturday and Sunday in New York, Monday, and then Monday night I used to get on the train, go back to Georgia, and she came back to Bristol. So we used to have a little siesta, you know, <laughs> a little rest period. What? Well, where did you work after you got out of the service? Well, when I got out of the service was 1946. I was working at a Stenoco gas station on Bristol here, T.C. Truden Incorporated gas station. I worked in various garages for quite a while until I got a job in New Departure, which was beautiful, beautiful. It was altogether different, naturally. <laughs> I worked in the pay department, and there was a beautiful job. It's all gone now. Yeah, all gone. Did you uh, did you use the GI Bill to go to school? No, I did not. But I went to work back to New Departure when I came back from the service. And got my old job back, and I knew it wouldn't last, because they used to make bearings. And with, with no ward, the bearing did, would drop down a lot, drop. So anyway, I said, I got to get me a job somewhere, a, a good, steady job. So I tried for the Connecticut State Police. I tried for the Bristol Police. And I tried for the post office. State of Connecticut wouldn't take me on account of this. I got very high marks, but Colonel Hickey, I think his name was Hickey, State Police Commissioner. And he, said, he asked me for an interview, so I went for an interview. He said, why did you put in for state police? I said, I wanted a job. I like the job. I'd like to be a police officer. He said, you must have known what the eyes you got, you'd never make it. I said, I just thought maybe if it was good enough, I got a good score and everything, that maybe it'd be a little, a little exception. He said, we can't do that. Because if a bandit or a bad man takes your glasses away, you're, you're lost. So he said, we can't accept you. I said, well, okay. so what can I do? So I came back, and then I had the city police to fall back on. They wanted me, and the post office called up. They wanted me. Here I is. Now I've come home, and i got more jobs than I know what to do with. So uh, what I did is I had a friend of mine who was a sergeant in the Bristol Police Department, Sergeant Kane. So I said, Jimmy, I'd like to talk to you. He said, come on in, come on in. Jim, I said, I got... A job, two jobs, and I said, I don't know which one to choose, and I said, I want to get your opinion. I said, I got a job here I can take with the police department where you're in, or else I can get in the post office. Norm, he said, I wouldn't tell you what to do, but I'll tell you what I would do. I'd take the post office. He said, a lot of junk you don't have to take. They're like in the police department, you got you to gotta take an awful lot of junk. So I didn't, uh, I went to the post office, and I stayed there for 30 some years, 33 years. And that's where I, uh, like I retired from there. And I retired from there in 1977. I've been retired since 77. Imagine that. That's almost unbelievable. 35 years. More than I worked. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's, 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 you know. Well, let me, uh, is there anything else that you would, would like to add? Any other memories? Uh, geez, you... I think we covered an awful lot. Well, I'd like to thank you for your you service. You got enough time? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you for your service, and, and thank you for this interview. Thank you very much.